Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. I'm real pleased to be here. I'm going to talk to you today about circumbinary planets, but something a little bit more interesting in my mind, which is how SDSU became the world's leaders in the field of circumbinary planets. So um, the way this happened is <coughs> uh, myself and these uh, three other gentlemen here put a lot of time and effort into this, and it's paid off. Uh, so Jerry Oros is in the astronomy department. Gerwin Miller is a student who graduated, got his master's degree, has stayed on in our department sort of as a lecturer. And then Don Short, a lot of you know Don, he's from the math department. He was the former dean of the College of Sciences. So we have him working uh, all uh, hours of the day and night on this, and he loves it. So we've had tremendous fun here, and we've had um, remarkable success. So a couple of things we've, we've got here, and we've gotten actually some worldwide attention um, on this. So how did this all happen? Well, let's turn back the clock and go right to the beginning. And it starts a long time ago in 1984 with this gentleman here, Bill Baruki. And he had an idea of let's find planets around other stars. And he had this idea of building a telescope, putting it up in space, proposed in 1992, and it got rejected, proposed again in 94, 96, 90. Every time it got rejected, rejected, rejected. And then finally in 2000, it was accepted, and the mission launched in 2009. Um, going back to that 1984 paper, very quickly, what do we have here? He's talking about, we're going to find planets by the way they block the light from their star. So you're, you've got a telescope, you've got a star, you've got a planet going around it. If the planet comes between you and the star, it's going to block a little bit of the light. And you measure that little dimming of the starlight, and you can detect a planet that way. Now the difficulty is, to find an Earth-sized planet, it's about a hundredth of a percent. This is very, very hard to do. This cannot be done uh, with a ground-based telescope. So you need to put a telescope up in space. Now, at the time, in the 80s, the precision from uh, ground-based telescopes was about 1%. And you can do a little bit better than that. But you're, you need to do a lot better to find these type of planets. Fast forward a couple years, there was a um, meeting here in San, on San Diego State campus um, about high-precision photometry, how you measure the brightness of stars. And Bill Baruki was there, and one of our adjunct faculty, Andy Young, was part of this effort on how to uh, measure the with high precision the brightnesses of stars. Uh, and so uh, a lot of what came out of this meeting led directly into the development of the characteristics of the telescope, what things needed to be done. For example, you've got to put it up in space, you've got to look at a few hundred thousand stars, it's got to be at least a three-year mission. <coughs> So um, what is a transit? What are we talking about? We're finding planets through this transit method. A transit is simply a small eclipse. So an object goes in front of the other, and it blocks some of the light here. So you may have remembered a few years ago, we had the transit of Venus. Venus went in front of the sun, and it blocks a little bit of the light, about a percent of a percent. Uh, that's a picture I took right here on campus with my little cell phone on the roof of the uh, astronomy building there. So a transit is just a small eclipse. Now, we can't see pictures of stars. They're all just little dots of light. But we can measure their brightnesses. So what we have here is um, the data showing the brightness of the star versus time. And a few hours are going by. And then you see this characteristic U shape. This is a dimming of the light. And the depth of this dimming depends upon the size of the object. So the bigger the planet, the deeper this eclipse, or we call it a transit. Okay, and it goes as the radius, since it's the area, it's the radius squared. So if you know the size of the star, you can measure the size of the planet simply by seeing how much of the light dims. It's, it's that easy. Okay, so if it's that easy, well, why don't we do it here at Mount Laguna? So you try, and you do find transits. You can find planets that way. Here's some data one of my students took. Um, and you can see we're getting a precision of about half percent. Which is okay, it's good enough. This is a, a, a planet which is about twice the size of Jupiter. Easy to detect, uh, even with a small telescope. But to find Earth-sized planets, uh, that's about the thickness of the black line there. So we can't do this with our telescope. Why can't we do that? Well, here's the problem. This is what a star looks like at high magnification. It's dancing all over the place. This is twinkling. And this is due to the Earth's atmosphere. There are turbulent cells, there's changes in pressure. Changes in pressure cause changes of index or refraction. Anyway, it jumps around a bit. It, I defy you to measure the brightness of that object <laughs> to one part in 100,000, which is what you need, right? So one part in 10,000 is kind of the signal, but you've got to be better than the signal. You don't want a signal to noise of one. You want to do better than that. So you 
need typically one part in 100,000. That's not going to work. So that's what you get from the ground. This is what you get if you go to space. This is a Hubble Space Telescope. You get a precision of one part in 10,000. Nevertheless, this is still not good enough for what we want. Hubble isn't quite the right type of telescope, so we need to build a new telescope, and that's where Bill Baruki's efforts went into. Here's the mirror for that telescope. Here's the camera. There's the telescope, and, uh, and the spacecraft gives you the scale of the thing. Now, I joined the picture in 2007 when NASA realized we're going to build this telescope, but we actually have a very small team of people working on it. It would be really good to bring in some outside expertise. The field is growing very quickly. Let's get some new people in to have some new ideas rather than Bill Baruki's original idea from the 1980s. So about a dozen people were brought into the mission, and I joined it in 2007. And it's been a fantastic, uh, fun ride ever since. So I was there for the launch in 2009. Um, and let me just very quickly tell you the summary of what Kepler's done, because I want to talk about specifically what we're doing here. But this is um, the part of the sky that Kepler was looking at. There's 42 different cameras, and that's what these little squares are. There were three planets known in that part of the sky before Kepler was launched, and after the Kepler mission, that's what we have. So just to summarize what Kepler's done, we've got about a thousand new planets. Five planets are known to be smaller than the Earth. Almost 5,000 planet candidates. So these are planets these are stars that have transits. They look like planets, but we're not really 100% sure. Well, more like 80, 90% sure. But that's still pretty good. Um, a lot of multiple star systems. A lot of systems are between the size of the Earth and Neptune, which is weird, because in our solar system, we have two kinds of planets, big ones and small ones. Most of the planets we're finding are in between. So our solar system is kind of missing all of those. Uh, at least 17% of stars like the Sun have planets, which is really cool. And 71 planet candidates are in the right place to have the right temperature for liquid water, the right size. Now, I haven't said anything about binary stars. <laughs> this is where we come in. We've done a lot of the, all that stuff prior to that, prior to that, we've done a lot of work on. But this is where we have really uh, done excellent work. So a lot of stars out in the sky are actually binary stars. You look up in the sky, you look at a star, chances are it's a binary star. <clears throat> so, the um, question is, can you have stars, uh, planets, and binary star systems? Well, if the two stars are really, really far apart, you can have a planet around one of them, and it doesn't care. And the answer is yes. We know dozens of those. But ones if the stars are really close together, and you have a planet going around both of them. And so these would be called circumbinary planets. And things got really interesting about four years ago, when we actually had our first discovery of a circumbinary planet. <laughs> And so uh, we got a lot of attention, some good, not, some not so good, but that's uh, fun. Um, <clears throat> it was done by Lawrence Doyle. It's called uh, Kepler-16. It's the first transiting circumbinary planet. Um, it goes around and starts every 229 days. Lawrence Doyle, another SDSU connection, is alumnus. He got his uh, master's degree from the astronomy department in the 1970s. Now, he spent years looking for these circumbinary planets. He spent a lot of his career doing it and spent years of time with the Kepler data and had a lot of difficulty finding them. And we were wondering, maybe they don't exist. Some of these theorists might actually be right, uh, who had predicted they don't exist because it's too chaotic of an environment. Um, so we were wondering, wow, this is really hard. What, what's going on here? And we were kind of stuck. And then I had some inspiration. <laughs> <laughs> and the idea is the following. For every circumbinary planet that's out there that transits, you have to have things aligned perfectly, right? That planet has to go right between you and the star. If it's tilted just a couple degrees, you won't see it. So just a little tiny tilt will mean you don't see it. Um, and so the question is, maybe there's lots of them out there uh, that you're not seeing. And there should be many, many more out there. For every one you should see, you should see tons of them that you don't see. So the question is, could we find these? And the answer is, yeah, we can find them in a different way. And the way is called eclipse timing variations. So you've got the two stars going around each other, and they have these eclipses. And you can use that like a clock. And if it's periodic and it's like clockwork, nothing's happening. Great. But if sometimes they're early and sometimes they're late, then you've got something going on here. So here's just a quick sketch of some of the data. Here's one of the clocks. There's the other clock. They're not running at the same period. And the little wiggles in there are actually telling you the orbital period of the planet. Uh, let me skip through this and just jump right to the punchline here, which is <clears throat> uh, one of the early punchlines, which is we're able to find Kepler 34 and 35 using this technique right off the bat. So I found Kepler 34. Within 24 hours, Jerry Oroz <laughs> wasn't going to be uh, um, left out of this. He found another one. So we got two of them back to back. 
So these, this was really good. Uh, a few months later, we published another one, and this was a fun system because it's a multiple planet system. Um, so we got a nice little video there. And so here's the list of circumbinary planets. If you look at some of those names there, you recognize, you know, Doyle is an SDSU alumnus, there's us. Um, we did a lot of work with this system here. Schwamm and these folks, they're amateur astronomers who found this. And Kostov is a grad student. And uh, let me just get to the punchline here. We are responsible for seven of the ten cases and have been involved in every single one of these discoveries. Questions for Bill? Bill. Um, Bill, I, I, I may have asked you about this before, but I was wondering, since, since we, we use uh, optical phase conjugation really well with adaptive optics, and if you had those installed either at MLO or uh, Kepler or anywhere, uh, would that help? No. <laughs> the reason I say that is these systems are really far away, mm -hmm. um, you know, thousands and thousands of light years. So the angular scale is too small. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I pause for a minute because the answer in general is yes. Uh, for the nearby planet systems, and NASA is really working hard on this, building uh, telescopes that can actually do this for the, the, the very closest star systems. But for the typical one with planets, well, they're much too far away, so they're not going to help with these. But it will help with other studies, and there are some cases where you actually can see the planet. They're a little different than these. They're planets still forming, so they're still hot, and they're still glowing from formation. So they're not reflecting light off the star or anything like that. And they're so far from the star that, you know, in, in our lifetimes it'll move this much in its orbit or something. But you can, you can see them, and there are about half a dozen of those. Are there interesting follow-up questions you can do once you've discovered them, or are you just off to discovering the next one? Both. <laughs> so, um, yeah, there's a lot of interesting stuff I haven't gotten into here. Um, one of the things that we're finding is a lot of the circumbinary planets are around the longer period binaries. The shorter period binaries don't have any planets. Why? We don't know. Because it should be easier to find them. The, the, the closer in the stars are together, the tighter everything is, the more frequently things happen. Um, they're easier to find and we don't find any of them. So there's something saying that for the really close-in stars, there's something preventing planets from being there. So that's one thing that's interesting. Another thing is these planets are as close as they possibly can be to the binary without becoming unstable. So to me, this smells like a critical phenomena where things move along and then they stop right at the point of chaos. And so there seems to be a, a buildup there. Um, so if they're any closer, they get ejected from the system very, very quickly. Um, so that's another interesting thing there about planet formation. The fact that you have multiple planets, they're all coplanar, because they could be at any random angle, that kind of tells you they're all forming from the same cloud in the same way. And that planet-planet interactions aren't scattering them up and all over the place. Sometimes we expect that to happen, but in these cases it looks like it's not. So we're learning about planet formation, star formation, um, uh, the, the way these Planets, when they form, they have to migrate inwards. They don't spend all their, they don't stay where they form. They tend to move inwards towards the star. Uh, one thing I haven't mentioned is habitable zone stuff. These guys, 50% of these are in the habitable zone. That's an astonishing number. Now, we don't, I'm not jumping up and down about this because these are gas giant planets. We don't think there's life on them. But if these guys have moons, and let me go to this <laughs> figure here. You know, we snuck in, the artist snuck in a little tiny moon right there. <laughs> If you have a moon on one of these guys, it's in the habitable zone. And although we don't have the precision yet to detect a moon like that, that's a place where you could have life. So we're working hard on it. You mentioned that this, more of these planets of various sizes have been discovered. It's made our solar system look sort of anomalous yeah. that we don't have those mid-sized planets. So has that generated some more theories about the planet formation in our own solar system? Yeah, absolutely. Um, why is it that we don't have Jupiter-sized planets close into the star? And why don't we have the most common type of planet in the universe? We don't have any of those. <laughs> It's weird. So what is it about the solar system? A lot of it is we're starting to think that, you know, it's kind of random. 
right? You know, you get some big planets, you get some small planets, you mix them, you know, sometimes you have a dozen, sometimes you have eight, and it just depends on what happens. And our roll of the die is we got one star and we got eight planets and a couple of small ones. And um, it's not that unusual because we haven't been able to probe really far out. All the, all the technology we have measures the the close-in planets. So a planet like Jupiter and Saturn, which may take dozens or hundreds of years to go around the star, we don't have enough, we haven't monitored for 100 years, so there's no way we could catch those. So maybe we're still a little bit biased in our views. I think our time is up. But All right. Let me ask one real quick question. Could you, for those people who are not Star Wars geeks, could you <laughs> briefly mention the connection? Uh, let's see if we go. Uh, because that's one of the things that turns on a lot of people who watch Star Wars, right? Oh, how do we go? I don't have my keyboard here. Uh, you don't have to show the movie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, the, the, that scene from Star Wars is on the planet Tatooine. And Tatooine has a binary sunset. It's one of the epic moments in the movie where Luke decides he's going to become a Jedi. Uh, and there's a double sunset. And uh, that double sunset is exactly what you would see from one of these circumbinary planets. You have two stars and two suns in your sky. Thanks. Sure.